Chuck, thank you, and good morning to everyone. Ten years ago, APA pioneered and introduced the concepts of total cost of ownership, or TCL, to the educational facilities community. A major APA CIFAR research project on TCO and asset management conducted by APA past president Doug Christensen resulted in the landmark 2007 publication entitled Buildings, The Gifts That Keep On Taking. Within the last 12 months, APA has moved forward with an important new strategic initiative to support understanding and adoption of TCO. This initiative ties directly to APA's strategic standards program. And last year, the APA Standards and Codes Council, which is uh, led by APA past president Brooks Baker, has paved the way for our membership organization to become an accredited standards developer of the American National Standards Institute, better known as ANSI. As an ANSI standards developer, APA seeks to develop American national standards that support total cost of ownership principles for facilities and infrastructure and for facilities management as applicable to the education sector and as they relate to the following four competencies, which you are all very familiar with, general administration and management, maintenance and operations, energy and utilities, and also planning, design, and construction. Through its ANSI accreditation, APA seeks to elevate our profession and transform and continuously improve our learning environments for our students and for our campus communities. It is without question that the, that the condition and quality of our campus facilities has a direct impact on student learning and well-being. Deferred facilities maintenance and a failure to address aging campus buildings and infrastructure hinder our institutional mission. And they occur when we fail to view our campus buildings as the truly important and vital capital assets that they are. The societal good our campus facilities produce is immeasurable and with the many challenges facing our educational institutions, it is more important now than ever before to embrace adoption of total cost of ownership principles and practices. This morning, I am very pleased to moderate a panel discussion with several key leaders and members of the APA Total Cost of Ownership Workgroup, or what we call the TCO Workgroup. These dedicated facilities professionals are among the 27 subject matter experts who are developing our standard entitled APA 1000, total cost of ownership for facilities asset management. I'll now ask each of them to come to the stage. First, would you please welcome the co-chair of the APA TCO Workgroup, Anna Tamer, Assistant Director of Planning for the University of Texas at Austin. Next, if you would, please welcome Jim Whitaker, President and CEO of Facility, Facilities Engineering Associates. Also, Tom Harkenreiter, Chief of Operations for the Soka University of America. And finally, please welcome Bob Askerlin, Assistant Vice President of Facilities at Salt Lake Community College. Thank you for being here today. Very much appreciated. And we'd like to start off with a few questions that we have um, for you. One is uh, that total cost of ownership, we know, is a term we hear a lot about these days, Anna, but it has no formal de definition. And perhaps you could talk a little bit to us about what the work group is now developing in terms of a definition for TCO. Uh, thanks, John. There's 24 TCO working group members um, that are working towards a TCO definition a mission and vision statement, as well as key principles um, around the phase one of this TCO answer, ANSI standard. What you'll see on the screen here are major points of that definition, and I'll say that it's still in draft form. Um, the first of the TCO definition really uh, states that TCO is an investment strategy designed to work with your missions, uh, your organization's mission. Um, it includes first costs, acquisition costs, finance costs, maintenance costs, lots of costs, recapitalization costs, repair costs, in order to evaluate specific decisions that your organization is making. Um, really looking for a holistic approach in terms of the total cost of ownership, not just pieces of that. 
Um, it's scalable. TCO is very much a scalable um, uh, uh, process. We're looking to uh, have the ability to make decisions based on a specific component or an amalgamated holistic group of um, assets within your organization. Um, so for the TCO definition, that's what we have for our major points. As far as our um, mission and vision, we're really looking to make this a trusted, holistic, and transparent process by which um, institutions and organizations with limited resources have a means to make those decisions that will impact um, those organizations and reduce risk. And so you really are looking at a holistic approach to, to managing our facilities from cradle to grave. And it's, it is much more than operations and maintenance. I guess um, it, it, it goes into the planning cycle. It goes into construction. We're talking about recapitalization as well. I, I believe that's, that's the case when we talk about holistic. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, we're likely all familiar with the term life cycle costing, and that typically touches on what you just mentioned, maintenance and operations, um, and also looks at recapitalization and how you, that might impact your decision um, for that particular asset. But what TCO does is capture all costs, including first costs, including demolition and decommissioning, and really in, includes all of those to make decisions on um, what you're looking to purchase or what you're potentially going to do with that particular asset. So yes, absolutely, not just maintenance costs, not just recapitalization, but all of that, including the birth and burial costs. Very good. Other, other comments or, or considerations from the group? Bob? I, I, I'm really excited about this because it it's causes us to look uh, bigger picture at projects and determine uh, where those costs ought to be applied in that life cycle. And uh, you push one side cost-wise, it benefits you somewhere else on the O&M side maybe, if you expend more on the front end. So it's an exciting uh, tool to help us uh, make those data-driven decisions. So it's an exciting process. Yeah, very good. Others, sir? Yeah, I'll just borrow Lander's comment about culture shift. It's definitely a culture shift away from 99 cents is less than a dollar mentality. <laughs> Very good. Um, let's ask another question, and I, I'm going to ask Jim Whitaker on this one because he serves as the chair of the Facilities Management Standards Committee in ISO, which um, incidentally another key leader in that activity is our own Ted Widener from Purdue University, who's here in the audience as well. Um, and I'd like to ask Jim if he could share uh, his perspective on the value standards are bringing to a society and a profession, and how does standards drive a positive result for any sector or industry? Sure. Well, starting with the premise that there are literally hundreds of, of technical guidance and management system standards uh, across the board. Uh, specifically, when we look at the value of, of standards, I, I truly believe there is value across each of those areas of the society in general, industry, and, and the FM profession. So if I can start kind of high level very briefly and drill into some of the specifics. From a, a, for society in general, you know, standards are really developed to ensure that products and services are safe, reliable, and of good quality. Uh, you know, standards are designed to help protect the public and to help organizations like ours uh, ensure compliance with laws, regulations, and, and codes. Uh, for industry, I think standards really help raise the bar in three distinct areas. First, they improve productivity and performance by creating uh, improved streamlined processes, uh, by optimizing the use of resources, and by minimizing waste. Uh, secondly, when it comes to encouraging innovation, I think standards really do help with the exchange of knowledge and continuous improvement. And finally, standards help ensure quality across the global supply chain. And they do this by improving transparency, by removing barriers to trade, 
uh, and in ensuring quality across the global supply chain. Now, th this isn't important just for international corporations, but for our colleges and universities because we draw on students from around the world. Finally, for our FM profession, and specifically the educational facilities profession, I think this is where we see the greatest value proposition for standards in continuing to elevate the facilities management profession. And, and they do this, specifically the TCO standard, by providing a rational approach using industry best practices to provide repeatable and consistent processes and uh, outcomes or, or results, and to improve our performance and, and quality. And specifically, TCO is designed, I think, to really help us ensure confidence, improve confidence and credibility in what we do, and it's gonna be very important. Now, I know there are skeptics out there that believe standards do little than add cost, complexity, and maybe stifle uh, innovation, but again, I really do believe that the, the TCO standard that we're working on uh, does and will bring value uh, in, in supporting what we do from an FM operations standpoint. Very good, so we, could, we might imagine a day where the TCO standard serves as the benchmark an approach for any facility owner, but in our case, with our audience, the educational facilities sector, to be able to express and explain how to manage our properties in a, a common framework document and also a standardized approach that all of us can, can, can uh, cling on to and make sure that we're, we're advancing what's best for our students and our campus. Absolutely. Um, other questions or thoughts? If not, I, or Tom? Well, I'm thinking value, that's a key word. If there's a takeaway, Takeaway value is a key word. Yeah, very good. I think um, I do have a question for Tom and for Bob. Both of you um, are responsible for overseeing campus facilities for your institutions, and they're very different from one another. I know that at Soka University, it's a four-year private institution in California. Um, in Bob's case, Bob uh, is the AVP for a community college. Um, could you perhaps both share some background on your institutions, some some information about uh, your institutions, and then also share how a TCO standard will bring value back to institutions in all of higher ed. And, and um, Tom, we could perhaps start with you. Okay, a few words about Soka University. It's a private, nonprofit, liberal arts. It's been in operation for 15 years now. It's already ranked within the top 50 liberal arts universities in the country. Number one with respect to value and it is known as the most international university in the country with representation from over 40 countries. I am the only facility staff person there. A decision was made early on to outsource and we've combined the best of corporate America and APA in doing so to the extent that Soka received the 2014 Award for Excellence. Very proud of that. Anyway, the way that TCO has benefited Soka, and Soka, by the way, is Japanese for creating value. When I first met with their organization, their administration of three people 20 years ago, one of the first questions I was asked was how much money they should set aside in a reserve so they never have a capital renewal or deferred maintenance problem. Now, I thought Rod Serling was just going to walk through the door. I, I, I was blown away. But I thought, man, this is the organization for me. I, don't know, I really want to be part of this. But I was in private practice as, a, as an operations consultant for them. And my first assignment was to come up with an estimate of what all the operating costs were going to be. Then once we got the buildings designed and we had something to work with, we did a component replacement model, so we know what the recapitalization was going to be. So in essence, uh, they, they benefited from TCO right from the beginning, but I need to give a lot of credit to Doug Christensen from BYU in that effort, and John Gallette from Vanderbilt that's here, who is very creative in establishing their recapitalization fund. The Salt Lake Community College was established in 1948, and uh, is truly Utah's only community college. We're typically in the top five in associate degree granting institutions in the country. Uh, we have about 11 locations up and down the Wasatch Front in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake County is our service district. Uh, 
about 400 acres at those 11 sites. We have about 2.5 million square feet, uh, 2,100 or 2,200 full-time staff and faculty. So uh, it's a fair-sized institution. Uh, we, we try to uh, address and be where we need to be in the Salt Lake Valley. So it presents a very unique challenge for us. Uh, we're very quick reacting. Uh, we opened a site in, in an area of West Salt Lake City in a little under 12 months from uh, conception to signing the lease uh, up and going. So we're, we're, we're quick to respond to the needs. Um, I see this standard as something that helps us ha to have uh, dialogue with, with a common set of definitions. Um, as we talked to our business office, the Nakubo, Wakubo folks, uh, we'll, be, we'll be, to steal Lander's metaphor, we'll be singing off the same sheet of music uh, instead of uh, mixing up messages due, due to uh, non-common definitions. It's also very fortuitous at this point, our legislature and oversight bodies are starting to ask these exact questions of us. Um, our legislative fiscal analyst visited me last year and said, we want to go down this path. I said, so what are you after? And, and he said, well, we're after that sweet spot of money spent. If we spend more up front, what does it get us down the road? And uh, they quickly came to the realization that they had bitten off more than they could chew at that time. So this standard is going to be very beneficial for us in, in our setting, and I'm looking forward to its continued development. Very good. I know, um, and, uh, and maybe to paraphrase uh, Doug Christen Christensen a little bit, you, you could very easily call TCO a management philosophy, but it's really not. It truly is a leadership philosophy. Um, and it's not just a practice, but again, a philosophy. So maybe Tom, you could explain a little bit why it's important for facilities professionals to establish this TCO mindset, because it's not something you just do once. It's, it's a pervasive uh, culture that you need to develop. Could, perhaps you could talk some more about that. Well, truly, and like Lander said again, a culture shift. Much like when APA introduced the facilities performance indicators, the FPI, it gave us more latitude and more importance to be at the table, so to speak. We were dealing with more data. We were getting more strategic. And with this effort, it's even more data. It's all about data. And again, that earns us that seat at the table, that we're dealing with things that matter with the total costs. And believe me, it's out there. The uh, State of California Community College System is now including TCO in their RFPs. I worked on uh, one for Kern County. Uh, one of our vendors here just got a, awarded a project at Saddleback. TCO is part of that. It's there. It's a, it's a train that's leaving the station, folks. It's here. I think it's very, one of the reasons it's very important for us to get engaged. With, I'll use Landers' thing, to be engaged. Jim, Anna, any, any thoughts, sir? Yeah, I think real quickly, just in how Doug and Anna established the, the framework for the standard really tells that story of the, the leadership philosophy. Many standards are developed around a technical requirement. TCO standard is developed around principles. And that, to me, really relates to the importance of the leadership aspects of the TCO standard. Just getting into a specific example, um, you know, too often we're building a new building or replacing an asset, and we only look at the first cost. We don't look at, potentially, um, we don't look at what it costs potentially to maintain that asset or training on that asset. Um, and I think that's a key point in what TCO tries to do, and that's just one example, how you need to look at the entire asset across its entire life, not just first cost, include that, but also the other costs included in that. Um, and, and for me, it's just about mitigating the risk to the university in, in terms of the resources um, and stewardship as well. Mm -hmm. And, it, uh, and of course, we talk a lot of the, the conversation on risk management continues to 
to expand and develop as well, and TCO can be a way for us to be more, uh, uh, we can assume what's coming up in front of us rather than being reactive to things, which is so important. I'd like to um, perhaps move on to the next question if we could. Um, the next question would be, we know um, you need a diverse group of facilities professionals um, to create a standard. You need manufacturers there. You need, other, uh, you need other subject matter experts to help you do this. And there are international standards out there that touch on TCO, and they include asset management standards. Um, they also include some service life planning standards that are being developed within ISO. So I maybe should point to Jim because he really is a, a leader on the ISO front. If you could perhaps share what those other standards are um, and maybe talk about how uh, the TCO work group is, is coordinating its efforts so that we're not, we're not being redundant in our activity. Sure, sure, John. Should I talk about the thousands of ISO standards specifically one by one? Sure, it just go through the whole list, and I think we got a slide up here we'll put up later. <laughs> There's a, a, Ted and I have been living this. There's actually too many to count, although ISO has 19,248 standards, not that I'm counting, where <laughs> Lander reads cookbooks, I read standards. You can obviously tell whose life is much more boring. Um, you know, there really are a lot of standards that relate to what we do. Uh, and hundreds that impact facilities. So it is important that we reach out, and we, we have embarked on some research to identify the standards that are out there that really relate to uh, and impact TCO. Uh, and, and we've been searching through not only ANSI, but ASTM and ASRE and even other guidelines from DOD and federal government around Defense Acquisition University, ASTM, et cetera. From an international perspective, there are a number out there that impact what we do. And in fact, I know a lot of people aren't really excited about ISO standards, especially in the US, but there are some good standards. Uh, and I think three of the most relevant ones include uh, ISO uh, 15686 around whole life costing, which is kind of the global term for total cost of ownership, different than life cycle cost. Uh, life cycle costing, but it is a, it designed from an engineering architectural kind of perspective leading into facilities. Uh, the other two that are really relevant, and John mentioned the ISO 55001, if anybody's familiar with the, the relatively new asset management management system standard, which provides a really good framework to managing assets of various types and not just facilities. Uh, and then finally, the one that uh, Ted and I have been working on for uh, probably a few years now uh, through our technical committee is the ISO 41001, uh, hopefully due to be published within a couple of years, but it's around facilities management, management systems. Uh, and this provides an overall framework looking at uh, leadership and commitment and resources through the execution and performance measurement in a kind of a plan, do, check, act model. So all of these are relevant. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we look at these other standards, create liaisons, and Anna, Doug, and Deke have helped lead this uh, creation of liaisons with the other standards and technical committees and standards developers to make sure that we understand the technical requirements of the other standards, uh, that we understand the goals and the intent of those standards, and make sure that we align with, uh, so we, at least we don't conflict with other published standards that are out there in international standards, and we create this common uh, terminology, common language, uh, and finally reference those other standards where it's appropriate. Our goal truly is, and I think our TCO committee, is to create a really usable, valuable standard for facilities professionals, even if it's simply to create that common language uh, to be able to integrate across different standards and databases. Very good. John, in addition to um, the ISO standards and other relevant standards, APA has a lot of initiatives as well. There's the APA Informatics Group, I believe they're presenting later this afternoon. Very interesting session, I'm sure. Um, and we've worked really closely with them. I've been on that informatics committee to ensure that the col collaboration and um, communication exists between that effort and this effort. We all need to be walking down the same path and speaking the same language. And um, APA Informatics is all about data and big data and how we use that to make decisions, very much in alignment with what TCO is doing. So working with that group, I think, is really key. 
Um, the APA, APA FPI report, that also has many elements that the TCO um, embodies. And I think working with that and continuing to work with that effort um, in collaboration is only going to strengthen that report as well as the TCO initiative so that we're all speaking the same language. And that's a good point because TCO, again, is about data. It's making uh, critical, good decisions, critical decisions based on the data. And um, I know with the informatics work group, there, they, there was a survey that was released last Friday to our, uh, what we call the uh, primary representatives uh, or key contacts within the APA membership, the institutions, um, to take, uh, ask, we, we surveyed them to find out more about what soft, software products that they are using. I know the informatics work group wants to take the results of that survey and perhaps even create um, uh, API or an interface with those software products to create perhaps a real-time beta test, a repository beta test of a real-time data collection rather than, a, rather than doing uh, data collection in a static environment, which is really, really pretty exciting. Uh, I think the informa informatics work group is being somewhat of an incubator for, for APA and is going to help uh, propel things that are going on in TCO. Um, so let's change the conversation a little bit and ask Tom, um, one of the things we're seeing, we, we've, we've talked about TCO for a long time, um, and, uh, and while we've had this conversation uh, 10 years ago or even five years ago, it seems to me that it wouldn't, that, that the time is now ripe to go ahead and pursue doing a TCO standard. Um, maybe technology has gotten to a point where we can really make this happen. It, uh, is it technology or is it something else or maybe, maybe other things beyond technology? Well, let's roll back maybe 10 years. Um, I was working with SAM, Strategic Assessment Model, and it was a big thing when my CMMS provider provided me with a portal, a graphic portal, so that I could get a digital dashboard, actual gauges on a real-time basis based upon the SAM metrics. Coincidentally, I introduced that CMMS uh, provider to APA, and that's how you got your, your gauges on the FPI. But that was then, and that was a big deal. Now we have BIM, and now that same CMMS provider can automatically load their system from BIM data and handle data. And I think the technology now is ripe for us being able to move forward, whereas before it would have been a stretch, technology speaking. Other, other thoughts? Bob? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, uh, as Tom said, with, with BIM and other things we've got now, 10 years ago it was a lack of data. I think today we've got an overwhelming amount of data. With the advances of technology and the convergence of what we're doing as, as strategic decision makers and leaders, I think that is the, it creates a, a really intense need for standards. And without those standards and an overwhelming amount of data, I think you've got chaos. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, others? Just it, the, time, the time is right. The, the stars are aligning for all of this technology to merge. We see the merging technologies on the educational side, and the same thing is happening here. Uh, it's, it's very doable at this point, and uh, I, I'm confident that uh, the institutions and the vendors uh, of, of uh, product and software can work together and pull this together and, ma and make it a very useful tool for managers of facilities. And I think in addition to technology, I think that's very relevant. Um, but in addition to that, we have um, come from, uh, our history suggests that we started as physical plant administrators. We were technicians just expected to turn the wrench. And today, we have so many more duties that they require and expect of us space management, campus planning, utilities, all of these things were now, that um, role that they've given us has now expanded. Um, and with those added responsibilities, we need additional tools to help us make those decisions and couple all that data together. Well, very good. Um, I think we have last, we're going to do one last closing question, and we're going to call this our rapid fire question. Uh, so I'm going to ask you for to give us maybe a four or five second response on this. So tell us, why are you passionate about writing this TCO standard and what it could do for facilities and education? And I'll start with Bob. 
just being able to be there as a community college, small college representative, and hopefully making that tool not so complicated that it overwhelms people, but is something very usable. That, I'm very excited about that and happy to be uh, able to work on that. Perfect. Tom? Yeah, maybe two takeaways. One is this is a common language for a common direction. And also as a professional and group of professionals, this train is leaving the station and we, don't, we really don't want to be left at the ticket counter, so to speak. Jim? For me, I think this TCO standard really is about the value. It's about how we continue to elevate the FM profession, enhance the, the credibility and improve confidence in our role in protecting and being stewards of the built environment. Great. Anna? The decisions we make today will far outlast us. And I'll say that again. The decisions we make today will far outlast us. And I think we're all wanting and have a desire to make the best decision. And I really believe that the TCO standard um, can provide us with a tool to make the best decisions that we can today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to all of you, Anna, Jim, Tom, and Bob, for being with us today. The work of this uh, work group is is uh, rather fascinating. It's, we've got an incredible group of subject matter experts and stakeholders that are helping us develop this as our first APA standard. So thank you very much, and thank you for being here today. Thank you.